Thank you, God, because you are here. Your presence is here, God, and we welcome you into this place. Thank you because we can come into this moment of worship and know that you're here, you're with us, you're listening, you're present. You are right next to us, God. I pray that you will open the eyes of our hearts so we can see you, so we can see you, God, so we can perceive you not just with our brain, with our heart, and be able to understand in the deepest of our soul that you are here, you are present, and you care about us. Lord, we love you. We thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's give the Lord a round of applause. Thank you for being here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. For those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Josh. I'm the lead pastor here at Downey First Christian Church. I get the privilege of bringing the word of God uh, to you. And this is a, it's a burden, but it's also a privilege to be able to do this. And I don't know if you guys are open this morning. Do you feel like your hearts are open to hear the word of God? Yes? I think that's why you're here. Like, that's my guess, that that's why you're here. And uh, just so you know that when I preach, I'm also preaching to myself. So this is, this, these are things that I've been working on throughout the week. And then God has been speaking into my heart. So I'm, I'm sharing with you, uh, not just, hey, this is what you have to do, but this is also things that I am working on myself. So I hope that's, that's good and that you're blessed by it uh, as I have been blessed throughout this week. If you're here for the first time, man, we are so glad that you've decided to spend this Sunday morning with us. Uh, so if you're here for the first time or you're new to us, not necessarily that this is your first time, but that you're new to us, uh, even if you're here uh, present physically or you're watching online, we're going to do something that we do every week. Most of you guys know what this is. And all we're going to do is we're going to ask you to raise your hand and put it right back down when I count to three. And I promise you, we're not going to embarrass you. We're not going to make you stand or do anything crazy. Just raise your hand, put it right back down, and we're just going to give you a crazy round of applause uh, from Downey First Christian Church. So again, if you're here for the first time, one, two, three, raise your hand over there. God bless you. God, that, was a, that was a quick one. Yeah, I almost missed it. It was very quick. Thank you for being here. Welcome to church. I hope that you're blessed here. And if you're here online watching us for the first time, it is such a privilege to be able to do this together. So we're going to go to the Word of God today. We're going to go to uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. And it says this. Listen listen to this and let this enter, come, go into your brain. Yes, you got to process it, but let it come into your heart as well. Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse 8, it says this. If you don't have a Bible, that's okay. If you do, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, verse 8, I'm going to read this for you. It says this, For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I'm going to read that again. For it is by grace you have been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Today we're going to talk about the topic of grace. We're going to talk about the amazing grace of God through Jesus. I'm going to pray one more time and we're going to get started. Lord God, thank you again for this moment. I want to pray, God, that our hearts will be open to hear your word. I pray that you'll take out any distractions uh, that we have, anything that we're thinking about. I pray, God, that we'll be able to just stop for this moment. Take off all the weight of the uh, preoccupations and all the things that are in our minds right now, Lord. And we just want to hear from you. That's why we're here, Lord. We thank you, Lord. And I thank you, God, because you allow for me to do this this morning. I, I'm humbled before you right now, willing to be used by you. I pray for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 So today we're continuing a series. We're continuing a series called The Message of Our Worship. The Message of Our Worship. And we've been talking about understanding what we sing. One of our core values we've been talking about is that worship is our spirit. And the reason for this, while we talk about worship, is that, is that when we raise our hands and when we sing and when we're, we're expressing the emotion uh, to God, is what we're doing is we're, we're, we're showing God that we're surrendered to Him. Now, there's two sides to this. To, when we talk about worship, I, I see two sides to this. I see the one side where, where you're just caught in your mind and you're caught in, in this whole idea of, of a, an intellectual experience of what's the content of what I'm singing and I got to know all the details and I got to process it in my mind and I have to evaluate everything and then I'm going to praise God. So there's an intellectual side to worship. But then there's the other side that is just merely like this woohoo experience of like, oh, I just feel I'm not really thinking about what I'm singing. I'm just kind of in the moment feeling all these things. So there's this this 
sort of dichotomy. And you can find some church that are all about the theology and all about the doctrine and it's got to be perfect. And then other churches, on the other hand, that are all about the woohoo and all about, and there's no doctrine, there's no theology in their, in their singing. So it's very interesting what the Apostle Paul writes to the church in Corinth. He says this, 1 Corinthians 14, 15 says, So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my understanding. So I'll pray with my spirit, but I'll also pray like I'll know what I'm praying. I'm not just praying whatever. And the same thing is with singing. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my understanding. And so what we're doing through this whole series is we're, we're talking about the songs that we sing in church. And we're talking about the content of these songs. And I have a feeling that as we unpack the meaning of this song, we're going to be able to worship deeper. We're going to be able to worship, uh, worship in spirit, but also understanding what it is that we're singing. And so last week we talked about what a beautiful name. And we talked about the name of Jesus. And we talked about the fact that Jesus is our rescuer and our deliverer. And Jesus rescued us from what? Oh, yeah, sin. Sin is a big deal, by the way. We talked about that last week as well. Sin is a big deal, and he rescued us from sin. And today we're going to talk about amazing grace. We're going to talk about the amazing grace of Jesus. We got the, the hymn, Amazing Grace. We also have uh, This is Amazing Grace from Phil Wickham. And the content of this is what I want to talk about today. You see, grace is, an, is, is such an important thing when it comes to our faith. Grace is one of those things that, that we hear it so often that it can get lost in the noise. We talk about grace, but we, we kind of like, yeah, okay, we hear it a lot, but what does it actually mean? Have you ever seen something so long that you forget that it's there? So I traveled to Chile a few weeks ago, and uh, that's where I grew up. I grew up as a missionary in Chile. And so I'm very familiar with the country. Like, that's where I grew up, and all the things that I saw were familiar. I'd seen them before. But when, I, when you're not in the country that you grew up in for two and a half years, you see things differently. Like you see the same thing, but you see it differently. For example, in Chile, you go to Chile and all the walls are full of graffiti everywhere. Like that wasn't new information. Like I grew up with that. But when I saw it, I'm like, wow, this is crazy. The other thing that I noticed when I was in Chile that I had not forgotten, but at the moment that I saw it impacted me differently was the fact that people park their cars on the sidewalk. And the reason why they parked their car on the sidewalk is because the roads are so narrow. Now, I hadn't forgotten about that, just that when I saw it, I'm like, wow, that is crazy. And so the reason why when I grew up and I would see cars on the sidewalk and I would see the walls with graffiti, the, the reason why I didn't really notice it was because it had always been there. So I think the same thing can be true with some concepts that we're very familiar with in church. Like we hear these concepts a lot, but sometimes they're so familiar, we hear it so much that, that we don't take the time to just pause and really unpack what it means. And that is the case with the whole idea of grace. So what is grace? We talk about saved by grace, the grace of God, uh, amazing grace. God is so gracious. But listen to this. Grace, brothers and sisters, is not a footnote in our Christian faith. Grace is such an important aspect of what we believe as Christians. So what is grace? What is it? Like, what's the definition of grace? So here, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it this way. This is, this, is, this is how I, the thought that always comes into my mind when I think about grace. What is grace? So when my daughter Amy was born, we took her to um, the hospital Kaiser, and uh, there was an under, underground parking, and in the underground parking, there was a little sign. And the sign said, um, five hours per, I'm sorry, five dollars per hour, but there is a 15 minute grace period. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, for every hour that you're there, you have to pay five dollars. But if you leave before 15 minutes, you don't have to pay anything. So in other words, you're getting that grace period. It's that period of time that you can park your car and you get something for nothing. You get to park your car for free for 15 minutes. And so when we think about the grace of, 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 of Christ and we think about the essence of our faith, which is grace, this is what Jesus did for us. So he saved us by grace, by nothing. Like we didn't pay for anything, none of it. Like it is, it is something for nothing. And grace is not just grace. Grace is amazing. It is so amazing. And someone once explained it to me this way. He said, he said there's a difference between, between justice, between mercy, and, with, and grace. So justice, if you owe $100,000, you got to pay $100,000. Mercy is you don't have to pay anything. Grace is not only do you not have to pay anything, but I'm going to give you an, ex, an extra hundred grand. 
That's what grace is. And that's why it is so amazing, and we can't forget that. You see, sometimes we get confused, and we think that, that our, our line of faith or the fact that we're disciples of Jesus is almost like a variation of all the other religions. But it's not true. If you think about the Muslims, Buddhist, New Age, Jewish community, um, it's, not a, it's not a variation. It is a completely different thing. See, every other religion or even every other way of life is based on this one word, and it's the word do. You got to do. You got to do A, B, C in order to be right with God. You got to do a bunch of stuff. No matter what religion it is, there's, diff there's a different list of things that you need to do in order to achieve, you know, a certain status, achieve rightness with God. It's all about do. That's why our um, being disciples of Jesus is so completely different. Even in the, our, the Jewish history, the, the, the way that, that the Jewish community would relate to God was through animal sacrifices. I mean, a lot of us know that. So, so there was this sacrifice of, of animals. Many times um, it was lambs that they would sacrifice before God, and that would atone for the sins of the community. Atone means covering over a debt. So this, this lamb, the sacrificial lamb, would cover over the debt of the community. It, but it was only for a time period. And it was only for a group of people. So it was still the word do. So it was still even our history, like our, where we come from, the, 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 the Jewish tradition, it was still based on that same word, which is do. You got to do stuff in order to achieve a right standing with God. In their case, it was the, the sacrifice of different things, you know, animals as well. But here's the thing. When you think about the Old Testament, and you think about all the animal sacrifices and all these rituals and all these things that they had to do, this was pointing to something greater. It was pointing to something greater. It was, it was pointing to something that was about to happen. Hebrews uh, 10, 1 says this, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities in themselves. Let's see, the law is only a shadow of the things that are coming. So there's something coming, and the, the, the law is only a shadow of that thing that is coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices, talking about the Old Testament, repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those uh, who draw near to worship. You see, the law wasn't an end in itself. These were shadows. These were representation. It was like, like a, a blurry image of someone as opposed to meeting the person face to face. So the, the, they had the blurry image before, like this picture that you can't really tell what it is. That's why Jesus says, Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So listen to this. Jesus is the fulfiller and the fulfillment of the law. And the same is true for animal sacrifices. So before we tried for years to cover it, it was never enough. It was like, like washing dirt, right? That's, it's, it's self-defeating. There was no way to be able to make that clean to the point where we come to this realization. It's like, okay, I give up. Like, I can't do it. Like, no matter how much I try, no matter how much I try to wash this dirt, it's self-defeating. There is no way. And actually, that's the point. The point is that we get to that moment where we say, I can't do it. Guess what? That's what Jesus is looking for, that we will come to that moment to where it is never enough. No matter what we do, it will never, ever compensate for the gravity of our sin. Until one day, one day when Jesus comes, oh man, John 1 29, so John the Baptist, he's baptizing and he sees someone, it says this, the next day John, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him and said, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And a little bit of context here, uh, if you don't understand the context, you'll, you'll be confused about why he was calling Jesus the Lamb of God. But Isaiah the prophet, 700 years earlier, was referring to this Savior that would come that would be slaughtered like a lamb. Isaiah 53. So Jesus would come and die for the sins of the whole world at one time. So he dies for the sins of the whole world at one time. See, it used to be several times and only for a few people. This was one time and for everybody. 
So it's Jesus, 1 John 2, 2. He says, he, Jesus, is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And not only for ours, not just the Jewish community anymore, not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world, the whole world. I love that. You see, it is finished. All other religions, and not just religion, but life is all about doing that's the key word. It's do. It's do. You got to do. You got to do. You got to do. But the reason why what our faith is so completely different than every other way of life, by the way, is because our key word is not do, but it's done. It's done. So we stand, we stand on the finished work of Jesus. We stand on his grace. That's how we walk life, on the grace of God. He took care of everything. The sins of the whole world. So maybe you think you're really bad. Hey, by the way, you're right. And so am I. Right? But Jesus paid a huge price. That's why he paid such a huge price. That's why he paid such a huge price. The sacrifice is complete. Praise God. Praise God for that. However, there's always a, if you notice in my message, there's always a however. However, 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 let me propose something that may seem crazy to you. I think it is possible that, that some of you, some of us, some, maybe even me, some of you are still sacrificing lambs at the altar. You see, you may, you may think like, what? That's animal cruelty. What are you doing? What, is that, what does that even mean? Well, I don't mean it literally. You see, the goal of the animal sacrifices was to get right with God. Remember, it was to get right with God. And you may be here this morning, and you, and you may feel that you're not right with God. You may think that you're not right with God. You may feel like you, you, you should have something to offer. Like I got nothing to offer at the altar. And we know in our minds that Jesus paid the price. He paid it in himself. We understand that in our brains. But it just seems too good to be true. It's like, where is the small print here? This can't be right. There has to be something more that we can offer. Maybe church attendance. I got to come to church because God deserves it offering because God deserves it. I got to serve, pray, growth group. All these things that are good, reading scripture are all good. But like I've shared before, that I have that tendency. Like I think we all do. Like I got to do something for God. Like he paid for everything. Like I, there must be something that I can offer. You know, that the tendency that I have, and I've shared this before, is that I, I tend to see God as a God that's like disappointed in me. Like, I always have to compensate. Like, I always have to do better. Like, his default toward me is disappointment. So i got to constantly try to do better, do better, do better. And I know that that's, not, that's theologically incorrect, but I have a tendency to try to offer God something so he'll be proud of me. But I know that that's not true. So, my, me, so me, myself, here's what I've been doing. I've been, I've been sacrificing at the altar of better performance over and over again. Maybe you're here and you've been sa sacrificing at the altar of church attendance. Maybe you've been sacrificing at the altar of offering. Maybe you've been sacrificing serving, praying, growth groups, all these things. And you may say, well, I did my Bible reading today, so I'm good with God. I did my prayers, so I'm good with God. I did my church attendance, so I'm good with God. I did my good deed of the day, so as a result of that, I am good with God. And even though these are good things, that, that, that logic is flawed. It's very flawed because it may seem like a noble thing to do, a good thing, even something that God would be pleased with. And by the way, he is, he is, but it does not change your standing before God. We all stand condemned before a holy God if it wasn't for Jesus. This is so important for us to understand. Think of it this way. So, if you have a house and you're paying for your mortgage, um, that's a big chunk of your paycheck, right? How many with me here? Yes. Somebody comes by and says, you know what? Let me take care of that. I'll just pay off your house. That'd be kind of nice, right? That'd be awesome. That'd be awesome. What if somebody did that for you? Pay off your house. Well, that'd be amazing. You don't have to, you don't have to write those, those checks every month anymore. You see, that's what Jesus did for us. He paid for everything. But here's the problem. Some of you guys are still writing checks. Like, you're still writing. Like, I, I got to, like, he, yes, okay, I, I, it just can't be right. 
Like, this is not right. Like, I don't think he actually did that. So you keep writing checks to the guy who paid for your mortgage, who, who paid off your house. You keep writing checks to him. And he's looking at those checks, and you know what he's saying? I'm not going to cash these checks because his account is empty. <laughs> my account is empty. Empty. I got nothing to offer God. I present myself spiritually bankrupt before God. We all do. You see, when we offer God the things that we offer him, we are not changing anything about our standing before God because everything's done. It's taken care of. And we stand and we walk on the grace of Jesus. You see, I would go this far as to say that when we think that there's something that we have to offer God, we're actually dishonoring the cross. You see, you may not mean it, but you're, what you're saying is there's something lacking to the cross. Like it wasn't enough. Like I think those nails should have gone a little bit deeper. I think he should have hung there a little bit longer. So I'm going to compensate a little bit for, for his lack of commitment, his lack of suffering. He didn't pay the full price. So I'm going to add a little bit to that price. I would go as far as to think that even though we're not doing it consciously, but if we think that we're affecting our standing with God because of what we have to offer, we have to understand that that's not true. You see, accepting the sacrifice of Jesus is about giving up. It's giving up. It's like, okay, I got nothing. I got nothing. I got nothing. It's about giving up. So much of our Christian, our, our Christian walk is about just giving up. You see, this not, may not change your activities, but it changes your posture before God of why you do what you do, why I do what I do. So I'll say again, that's why the key word here is not do. Got to do these things. No, no, no. It's done. It's done. It's all been taken care of. Which brings me to a short parable, and I'm going to end with this here. There's a short parable here in Luke chapter 18, which explains a lot. It says, Luke 18 says this. This is Jesus talking. Uh, Luke 8, verse 10, he says, Two men went up to the temple to pray. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, right? Every, th every time you hear the word Pharisee, you go like, dun, 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 like it's the bad guy, right? The Pharisee. And the other was the tax collector, right? Pharisee, tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. He's the arrogant one. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this. He's literally pointing at him. I mean, it doesn't say he was pointing at him, but he's referencing him. Or even like this tax collector. He says, I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of all that I give. But this tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You see, the assumption was this. The assumption was that the Pharisee was the one that stood justified before God because his job was literally full-time job, be a good guy. That was it. Be as good as you can was his job. You got this tax collector who from every perspective was the sinner. You would assume that he had no, there was no way for him to, to be justified before God. But as Jesus does, he flips it in this upside-down kingdom that we've been talking about. First will be last, last will be first. And so he ends by saying that the tax collector was the one that stood justified before God. Now, why is that? Because the Pharisee believed that he had something to offer. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of what I get. Maybe you're here today. And you think that you have something to offer. And this isn't to put anyone down. It's just so we understand how we stand. You may think you have something to offer. I am pretty talented. You know, I do a lot for God. I'm a big giver. I fast and I pray. Well, when we believe that we come to God with something to offer at the altar, we miss the whole thing. We don't have anything to offer. And then there's a tax collector. He falls on his face before God with nothing to offer. So my question to you this morning, the question to me this morning is, which one are you? Which one am I? You see, the assumption was that the tax collector would be condemned and the good guy, the Pharisee, would receive justification. 
You see, receiving this grace from God, which leads to salvation, is, is not about doing, but it's about giving up doing. So here's my question to you this morning. Have you been offering something at the altar? Thinking that that somehow makes you more presentable before God. We have to stop that. It's done. Let the grace come in. Let the forgiveness come in. Let the rest come in. Let the trust come in. You see, this is why the grace is so amazing. Because receiving his grace is really about giving up. You see, Jesus was the sacrifice to which all past sacrifices were pointing at. And it's done. It's taken care of. Let that in. Let that in your heart. But here's the fear. Here's the fear. I'm going to read your mind here. See if I can do that. The question that comes to you is, well, okay, now that I fully understand there's nothing that we can do um, to offer Jesus, then what's going to happen? People are going to start sinning like crazy. Right? I'm, of course. It's all paid for, so now we can just live however we want to live because he all, it was all taken care of. I don't know why people think that. Did that happen to you? No. Like when I, truly, when I understood what Christ did, and the more I understand what Christ did on the cross for me, I want to live for him. It's no longer a burden. I want to live that way. See, Paul addresses this in Romans 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? He's not presenting a challenge here. He's not saying, okay, now that you understand, now you have to work harder to be able to do these things. No, no, no. He's, he's presenting an impossibility. He's saying, if you truly understand what Jesus did, the result of that is going to be a transformed life. That's just how it works. It's not the other way around. It's not that you work hard to get salvation. No, no, no. You understand the salvation that you've received, and the result of that is a transformed life. That's a life of freedom. New house is paid for, right? So you got your house, it's all paid for. Ah, oh, that would be great, right? What are you going to do now? Destroy the house? No, you take care of the house. You make sure the garden is pretty. You paint the walls. You keep everything clean. You keep it going, right? So we're going to come to our time of communion now. And, uh, and then after communion, we'll have a moment of silence, and then we're going to go into a song. We're going to go into the song, Amazing Grace. This is Amazing Grace. And we'll think about the words. It says, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that, you, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the lamb who was slain, Jesus. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. So we're going to come to our time of communion now. And um, this is... We do this every week, but I, just, I pray that this never, ever gets old. See, we have two things right here, two emblems. One is the blood of Jesus that's represented by this juice here, and then we got the, the bread that represents the, the body of Christ. So what I want us to do now is, is I want us to think about this concept of grace, and I want us to think about the price that Jesus paid and how, and how huge of a gift this is that we have received. From Jesus. So we're going to take a couple of minutes here, just of silence, and whenever you're ready, you're going to take the bread, and then you're going to drink.